you got your Bibles, why don't you turn to John chapter 21. We're going to read a few verses together. This is a story that is at the end of John's gospel and is a story post-resurrection. So just to fill you in before we, we read the verses that Jesus has, has been crucified. He's resurrected and now he's, he's visiting. He's showing up and showing himself to his disciples and his followers. And the Bible gives us various accounts of that. You know, the, the, the crux and the heart of, of the resurrection story is the centerpiece of our faith. That without the resurrection, we're just celebrating another false Messiah crucified. But the empty tomb shows us this. It's evidence that Jesus is not just a Messiah that claimed to have a good message and share some great teaching and have some followers and operate as a rabbi on this earth. But it shows us, the resurrection shows us that He is God. He's God. And that's what John's gospel shows us. You see, John, when he writes his gospel, he has a different agenda to the other gospel writers. He's not necessarily interested in showing us that he is part of a Jewish lineage or, or, or the, the descendancy of, of David and Abraham. And he's not interested in that. You see, God, John's gospel starts this, that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word became flesh. In other words, what John wants us to know is the life and story of Jesus is not just a historical account of a human who lived on this earth and who amassed so much great wealth of, of, of stories through his time and his teachings that are expressed through the Scriptures. John wants us to know that the Jesus that he talks about in the Scriptures is God himself. He's divine. And when we, when we pull up in John chapter 21 after Jesus has been resurrected and he starts showing up to his disciples, there's a beautiful story of some of his disciples who maybe, I don't know, maybe they've got a little bit disillusioned that what they thought would happen hasn't happened. Maybe they're a little bit disappointed with themselves. We know Peter is one of the, the key characters in the story that we're going to read together. And we know this of Peter. We know that he's denied Jesus at this point. Maybe he's, maybe he's feeling a little bit sorry for himself. Maybe he's disappointed in himself. Maybe they're disappointed in God. Have you ever been disappointed in God? The God I gave my best and he invested everything. And you didn't work and move like I thought you'd work and move. Anybody been there? I can't see your hands, so don't worry. It's secret society this morning. You can raise your hand. And, and here's where they are, questioning how it all fits together, what's gone on in these last few days and what the last few years have been about. And in John chapter 1, it tells us this. He said, afterward, Jesus appeared again with his, to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them and they said we'll go with you so they went out and got into the boat but that very night they caught nothing here's Simon Peter maybe disillusioned maybe disappointed in himself he feels like he's let Jesus down maybe he feels like Jesus has let him down some of the commentators tell us that this might have been a sign that, Jesus, that Peter is actually returning to who and what he used to do because those of you who know the gospel story, you'll know that when Jesus first called Peter, he pulled up at the, at the side on the shore and Peter was out fishing. He'd been fishing all night and caught nothing. And that's where Jesus met him for the first time. And now, as we fast forward to the end of John's gospel and Jesus is resurrected, he almost finds himself back at the same place. And I don't know about you, you know, sometimes... In order for God to take you forward, He's got to take you backwards. And here is Peter again having his own moment of clarity once again. That, that he's trying to do it his own way. He's taking his life into his own hands. And at that moment, he gets nowhere. And Jesus shows up and meets him at the same place. And so if you're in here today and you have tried to work it out on your own and you've just got frustrated, you're disappointed and you're disillusioned and you've taken your life back into your own hands, I want to challenge you this morning to put your life back in the hands of Jesus 
Because it's when you put your life in the hands of Jesus that the miracle can take place. It says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Because when Jesus shows up and when Jesus gets involved, miracles take place not of human design and human origin and human wisdom but supernatural power that's what the resurrection represents friends the supernatural power of a divine God who incarnated and took on fleshly form for you and for me and who would suffer the cross and would pay the debt of our sin And it would rise from the grave victorious over death and over sin. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around and he jumped into the water. Then the other disciples followed in the boat, following with a net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, and there were fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter climbed back in the boat, and he dragged the net. It was a large catch of fish, 153, but even with that many, the net was not torn. Then Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. I love that about Jesus. That Jesus is about to restore Peter, but he doesn't sit him down and tell him everything he's done wrong. He says, come eat with me. Come eat with me. And you know, healing takes place in communion with God. And God invites each and every one of us this morning to come and eat. Come eat with me. Maybe you've got lost. Maybe you feel like you're not worthy. Maybe you feel like you're not, you're not sure how, how you've got to where you are because life's just taken you on some detours. And Jesus gives you the invitation this morning, come and have breakfast. Come, let's eat together. What I love about John's gospel is that John is painting such a vivid picture of the divinity of Jesus that even in the story that we read, it says the disciple who Jesus loved, who is John, the author of this book, He's, he says that they're in the boat and the, the, the sun's just risen and they're, they're maybe the clouds are over the waters and they see a figure in the distance on the seashore and they're trying to work out who it is. They don't know who it is. And then John says this. He says, it is the Lord. Not it is a good teacher. Not it is our friend. Not it is the prophet. It is The Lord. He's the Lord. I want to ask you a question this morning. When you look at Jesus, what do you see? What do you see? Because what you see changes everything. Because if He is the Lord, it changes the way you steward and live your life. If He is the Lord, it changes the way that you parent. It changes the way you treat those in relationship around you, your spouse, your loved one. It changes the way you approach your work. It changes the way you see the poor. It changes the way you see yourself. Because if He is the Lord, it changes everything. Everything. And what John wants us to realize is is this is not just a historical figure. This is God with flesh on. This is God Himself. In fact, when you go through the Gospel of John, you'll find... That he goes to great lengths to let us know that Jesus is the Lord. In John's gospel, you've got the seven I am statements. Here they are. He says, I am the bread of life. This is of Jesus. He is the bread of life. He is the one who can sustain. He is the one who can fulfill. I am the light of the world. Think about the power. 
that you can be trapped in darkness and the light shines in. I am the door. I am the entry point into relationship with God. I am the good shepherd. I'm not just a shepherd. I'm the good shepherd who leads you and guides you. I am the resurrection and the life. That's powerful, church. Come on. I am the resurrection and I am the life. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine who you want to be connected to. Not only do we have the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John, we have the seven signs. Sign number one in John chapter two, he turns water into wine. Sign number two, he heals the nobleman's son in John chapter four. John chapter five, he heals the man at the pool. John chapter 6, he feeds the 5,000. He walks on water in John chapter 6. He heals the man born blind in John chapter 9. And he is the resurrection of, of Lazarus. He raises Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. This is not just another man. This is the Lord. This is the Lord. And when the Lord shows up, everything changes. When the Lord shows up, the resurrection is not just a story that we read about and celebrate once a year. It's a story that happens in our lives. That the gospel is not a story of God taking a bad person and making them good. It's about God taking a dead person and bringing them back to life. The gospel tells us that we were dead in our sin. But when we came to know Him, He brought us alive in Him. That's why we get excited. That's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. That's why we raise our hands. That's why we give our everything to Him because He is the Lord. But when you look at Him, what do you see? What do you see? Is He your Lord? Is He your King? Is He the one you're submitted to that when He speaks, you'll obey? Is he the one who you look to as an example to live your life, to be shaped and molded by him? Not only do we have the seven I am's and the seven signs, we have the seven witnesses in the gospel of John. There's the testimony of John the Baptist. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. There's the testimony of Nathaniel that Mark spoke about last week. You are the Son of God. There's the testimony of Peter that you are the Holy One, God of God. There's a testimony of Jesus himself. And he says, me and my father are one. There's the testimony of Martha. She says, I believe you are the Christ, the son of God. There's the testimony of Thomas who says, my Lord and my God. And there's the testament, testimony of John himself as he writes this gospel. And he tells us why he writes it in John chapter 20. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. John's whole aim in everything that he writes from the beginning to the end of his gospel is so that you and me would see that this is more than a man. This is God Himself who entered our existence so that we could come close to Him. It might be a coincidence, but in the boat, John chapter 21, there are seven disciples, seven I am statements, seven witnesses, seven testimonies, seven miracles, and seven men in a boat in John chapter 1. Because you know what seven symbolizes in Scripture? It symbolizes completion, the touch of God. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of God. Because John wants us to realize that this is the Lord. This is the Lord. And when you realize He is the Lord, what is our response? Just like Peter, when he hears John say it's the Lord, what does he do? He wraps up his garment and he jumps out of the boat to get to Jesus as fast as he can. And it's symbolic because he's placing his life back in the hands of Jesus. And if you're anything like Peter and if you're anything like me, there are times in life 
where you take your life back into your own hands. And you need to come to a moment and a realization afresh. Some of you, maybe it's the first time, but for some of you, it'll be the hundredth time. It's a daily activity sometimes in some seasons that God, I'm not taking it back. I'm putting it in your hands because you are the Lord. And here's the great thing. When you place your life in the hands of Jesus, that's when the miracle can happen. There's a difference between my hands and his hands. There's a difference between your hands and his hands. I don't know about you as we, as we listen to the worship this morning. I'm just in awe at the talent of, of those who can play musical instruments. Anybody else? Just in awe. And, and I think about Marley on the drums. I think about him sat here and he playing away. And uh, for a start, he makes it look really cool, doesn't he? He looks really cool and he's doing it. But I see him and he's, in, and he's obviously coordinated, but to the untrained eye, my eye, I have no idea what he's doing. No idea. I just know it sounds good. And if I was to say to Marley this morning, hey, Marley, have a morning off. I'm going to play. Can you imagine his response? And he, he'd probably sit me down in the kit and say, play me a tune. And my tune would go something like this. What's that, what's that thing called there that you kick? Is that a pedal, foot pedal? You've got to do with a foot pedal at the same time as you play this thing. Like, I don't have that level of coordination. Because the truth is this, that this stick in my hands makes a poor tune. But when you put it into the hands of Marley, Marley, why don't you come up on stage? If you put it into the hands of Marley, it makes a sound that I could not make in my own strength. Like, I, I just don't have the skill and I don't have the wisdom. If I was to go to the keys and I was to say, Rachel, take a few moments off. This morning, I've always been waiting for this moment where I could lead worship and push everyone out of the way. But let, let me tell you, you don't want that. And if I was to play, I'd think that's pretty cool, wouldn't you? Pretty cool. Because in my hands, that's all I have to offer. Because the hands that you put something in determines the level of sound that can resound through it. And so if we were to put Molly on the kid, I'd say, Molly, just play us a little tune. Just, just give us a little solo this morning and just the sticks are in your hands. Play us whatever you want. Come on. I think I, think I did better. <laughs> I think I did, I did better this morning. Because the truth is this, whatever is in the hands of the person determines its value. If you were to put a basketball in my hands, it'd be worth around about 20 pounds. If you were to put that basketball in the hands of LeBron, LeBron James or Michael Jordan, for those of us who are a little bit older, it'd be worth a lot more. If you were to put a golf club in my hands, you better watch out because someone's head's getting taken off. But if you were to put it in the hands of Tiger Woods, it'd be worth millions. Because whose hands it's placed in changes everything. You see, Jesus, the gospel tells us that Jesus can take some spit and some mud and he can grab it in his hands and he can place it on the eyes of a blind man and he can see. The scriptures tell us that Jesus, he can touch Peter's mother-in-law and he can take away her fever just with the touch of his hands. The scriptures tell us that just with a few loaves and a few fish, that as they're placed into the hands of Jesus, Jesus breaks it and he blesses it and it feeds the multitudes because it's all about the hands that it's in. If you gave me some nails and some wood, you would not get anything structurally recognizable. But if you give the, the, some wood and some nails to Jesus, here's what you get. Forgiveness for one and for all because it's in his hands, through his hands, by his hands that everything everything changes and so this morning whose life whose hands should I say your life in your own or his your own or his 
And Peter in this moment, as he runs up to Jesus, he puts his life back in Jesus' hands. We know that Jesus restores him in this moment. And then here's what he says to Peter. He says, you're going to be significant. You're going to be a leader. Because now when you place your life in my hands, Peter, I can use you to your full potential. That you're going you're gonna to literally through you, Peter. Think about Peter at the day of Pentecost. He's the first one to stand up and preach. And he tells us that more than 3,000 people respond to the message and the gospel of Jesus as Peter shares it because he's put himself in the hands of Jesus. And when you put yourself in the hands of Jesus, Jesus can use you and he can send you into this world to accomplish something significant for his glory. And so maybe you're standing here thinking, well, my insignificant life. Yeah, when you put it in the hands of Jesus, he can multiply it, add to it and do the supernatural through you. And so we're going to sing this song this morning that the team have wrote called Send Me. Send Me. And I want you to use this as a response. It's, it's Jesus, as I put my life back into your hands this morning, I pray, I pray that you'd restore me. And I pray that you'd use me and that you'd send me. For some of you, maybe it's the first time you're ever going to make that decision. When this song's over, we're going to have a chance just to pray together. Commit our hearts and our lives to Him afresh this Easter weekend. So take it away, team. Send me.